So as we got into, if, as we get into chapter one of First Samuel, did you love it? Uh, how, how's the homework going? Okay, most of you did all of your homework, right? And if you didn't do it, that's okay. Thank you for coming, even if you didn't do your homework, because we all want to be here ministering and strengthening each other and finding out what God has to say to us. Now, this whole chapter, chapter one, is about Hannah, right? It's, uh, I know the whole book is about Samuel. The whole book is about um, other, some other people in here, but, and even this chapter speaks of some other people, but the whole chapter really speaks of what um, Hannah is doing and how she persevered in prayer and worship to the Lord and how the Lord rewarded her. Um, as we look at this, I want to remind you that um, in, chapter, in verse 2, it says, and he had two wives. This book is not about, it's not, it's, What's the word? Polygamy. Polygamy. I knew it wasn't the word that I was thinking. And it was, so. The whole chapter is not about the polygamy. However, as I looked at this, I had, I'll bet you had some of the same questions. I'll bet you wanted to know, where did this get started? How come this is okay? How come that guy's getting blessed when he's doing all of this stuff? It's not okay. It is not okay. See, I can't even, polygamy, not bigamy. It's not bigamy. It is polygamy that's going on. He's marrying more than one person. And um, it is not okay with the Lord. So I started asking the question, Lord, when did this start? When did this start where guys started thinking that it was okay to take more than one wife? Because it wasn't that way from the beginning. Um, uh, so I want to kind of address that issue. Um, uh, remember that right now they are at the end of Judges, and so they are in a place where everyone's doing what's right in their own eyes, and so we have that going for them right now. They have that excuse going for them. But how did it all get started? How did it all get started? And so... Um, Here's my opinion. Do you mind? You know, it's, it's silly for me to say, do you mind if I share my opinion? Because I'm going to share my opinion with you, and I hope it's okay. That's all I have to say about that. If you would turn with, uh, over to uh, Genesis chapter 6, and I just want you to see a little something there. And it says in chapter 6 of the book of Genesis, now it came to pass... When men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose, of, from all that they chose. I believe that this is the beginning of that time when they began to take on more than one wife at a time. They chose from all of it. Now, I know, if you are familiar with this chapter, um, I know that there is some controversy about who are the sons of God. Uh, we know who the daughters of, of men are, but that the sons of God perhaps were uh, fallen angels or something like that. I personally don't see scripture that backs that up. So, um, I'm looking at it, and I'm seeing something that's saying something completely different. It is not okay with God that this is going on. And um, Dave Rolfe uh, on Sunday was covering this chapter. He, had, he said nothing about this polygamy um, at all, but uh, just as he was reading through, he was saying that it's something like the uh, good and evil joining together. It was more like an unbeliever and a believer being married together, being joined together. And um, if you are spending all of your time with an unbeliever, uh, 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 all unbelieving friends, guess who is going to be uh, going in a different direction than they uh, 
than they started out. It's going to be the one, the unbeliever will draw us away if we are not investing time with other believers and with other people who are thinking in the same way that we are. We don't pull ourselves away from every unbeliever. We need to be have friends that are unbelievers. We need to have people in our lives that don't know Jesus, but we want to make sure that uh, we have this fellowship going on. But uh, so anyway, but let's look at the text, uh, the context of this. So in, in uh, chapter six of, of Genesis, in, in verse one, we've got the population explosion happen. And then the believers saw, um, the, the believers, so to say, saw the beauty and they took wives unto themselves. Eve looked at the fruit and said, it looked good. It was pleasing to the eye and she took it unto herself as much as she wanted, even though the Lord had told her not to do it. And then she went and she passed it over to Adam, her husband, which apparently was standing there during this whole conversation with the serpent, but that's a whole different story. So we won't get into that one tonight because we don't have the time. So what uh, um, here it says that the sons of God took from the beautiful women as many wives as they wanted, everyone doing what was right in their own eyes, whatever makes them feel good. That's what they did during that time. And God was not happy with that. Because we see in verse 3, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever. For he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. This was the time that there was going to be a, a, where that his life would end. I do not want to live 120 years. At the rate that my body's going downhill, by the time I got to be 120 years old, I'd have a toe left. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. I don't want to live that long. But anyway... Um, so that's where the beginning of the polygamy took place, as far as I'm concerned. That is my opinion. Take it or leave it, whatever the Lord shows you on that. It just gives me something where I can say, I understand this. I understand this little portion of our text. And so um, enough said about that. Having more than one wife, though, always, always, every time, every time, always, will be trouble. There will always be trouble. There will be jealousy. There will be pride. There will be all kinds of things. And that's why God said, one is enough. I, I said this morning, can you ladies imagine what would happen if you had two husbands at a time? And I heard ladies groan. Oh my gosh, you know, it's, are you kidding me? The one that I have doesn't understand me. So, um, yeah, so... Um, God's, uh, uh, but anyway, there's always a mess up when there are, more, when there's more than one wife at a time, and so that's why God said that you should be the husband of one wife, and so moving on, we go into the book of First Samuel, and verse one, we see that uh, they were going up to um, uh, who they are, and then we see the thing about the two wives, Peninnah and um, who had children. Hannah had no children. This man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts. In Shiloh also the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, and the priests of the Lord were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Peninnah, um, his wife, and to all of her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, Already we see the problem in more than one way. Although the Lord had closed her womb and her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. And so it was every year when they went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her. Therefore, she wept and she did not eat, speaking of Hannah. So commentaries tell us that the time that this feast is going on was most likely Passover. It was most likely the Passover that they were going into at this particular time. I had to hand it to Elkanah that he would go and he would uh, obey God and 
go and do the sacrifices to the priests, even though it was known that the sons of the priests were not good guys. They were not following the Lord. They were not doing what they should do. Elkanah believed God and acted in obedience to God's direction concerning his belief and what, uh, what he was about to do. And so when we talk about what was happening here, and um, then Elkanah, her husband, are, um, provoked her and all of that. And so um, in verse 4, where it says the, that he would give portions to Peninnah and then he would give a double portion or um, uh, to Hannah because he loved her, this is how it happened. The offerer of that sacrifice uh, received back a, a huge part of, um, of the sacrifice and uh, of, of the peace offerings, which he and his family and friends were accustomed to eating at social feasts before the Lord. We have that in Leviticus 3.7 and Deuteronomy 12.12. 12. It explains it a little bit more. But what had it become? Because we see evidence of this when we, we see... Um, Hannah, when she's in the tabernacle in the temple or in, in the tabernacle there with Eli, he thought she was drunk. Why did he think she was drunk? Because it was a normal thing. What was the sacrifice had now become a drunken party. Hmm, he assumed right away she must be drunk. And this is where the portions were gotten for Peninnah and Hannah. He gave Peninnah a bigger portion, a larger choice. In the Eastern fashion, showing regard to be the beloved or the distinguished guest, Genesis 43, 45. So he was showing that he loved her more. So no wonder Peninnah was what, no wonder she reacted the way that she did. How would we feel? Let's not be too hard on this woman. Yes, she made life miserable for Hannah. She made it miserable, but, what, but why? So I'm looking at this and I'm, I'm thinking, I'm always asking questions when I look at scripture. I'm always asking questions. I want to understand it better. What, uh, I, I wonder, was the marriage to Peninnah, was that an arranged marriage? Was that something that the parents had set up? And so he, that's why he was married to her. Was she Elkanah's first wife and then along came Hannah? Hmm, that would make me a little upset. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but it made me a little upset. And I think it made Penina a little bit upset. Was Hannah considerably younger than Penina? I'm going to say that I think she probably was. But again, that's my opinion. I don't have anything scripturally to back that up but I think that was the situation. So tell me, how would you feel in a situation like this? I, I might be that one that's going, me, 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 always <laughs> trying to get in there. So I don't know. But anyway, in chapter, uh, or verse 8, then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart grieved? Oh, he's such a, you know what? He knows exactly why she's doing what she's doing, and it's given away right here in the next sentence because he said, aren't I better than ten sons? You notice there's no response to that. <laughs> um, he knows, and I was listening to uh, John, John Corson, and he said, was it John Corson? I think it was John Corson. And he said, your husbands know what's wrong with you. But they'll do the thing of, what's wrong, honey? Because they don't really want to talk about it. And they say it that way because, in hopes that you're going to say, oh, nothing. And then they don't have to talk about it. And he said, we know all about you guys. And they do know. And so did Elkanah. He knew what was on her heart. He knew what was making her sad. And then he comes up with this big idea that he's better than that. Anyway, so, so Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking. He thinks he's all that. I don't know. Um, so she gets up after they finished eating and drinking. And Eli sees her coming in to the tabernacle there. And so... 
um, she comes in and she was in bitterness of soul. She and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Hannah was broken. At this point, Hannah was broken. You ever been to a place where you just, I'm broken. I, I, I can't, I don't even feel. I'm, I'm just broken. And I think all of us have been there before. She wept in anguish and she prayed to the Lord. What did she pray? Even though Colossians, the uh, book of Colossians was not yet written, I believe that she prayed for the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, which is Colossians 1, 9. I believe that that's what she was praying for at that time. And so she prayed, and then she made a vow to God. Now, she made a vow to God. She didn't make a let's make a deal thing, whatever that program is. And is that the one that does the behind door number three or whatever, door number uh, thing. This is not what she was doing. She made a vow, Lord, if you will do this, I promise I will do that. I will give this male child to you. She asked specifically that he would give her a male child and that she would give that male child back to him. Now, it's been said that the way to obtain any benefit to, is to devote it in our hearts to the glory of God. By this means shall God both please his servant and honor himself. So when you pray, the way to obtain any benefit is to devote, devote it in our hearts to the glory of God. By this means shall God both please his servant and honor himself. If we will devote ourselves wholly to the Lord, God gets the glory, and I get what I ask for. When the glory is always going to God, we want to give the glory to God. Not just a child, but a male child. It'd be necessary for him to be a him, because if it was a her, she couldn't be given to the temple. And so it was necessary that it had to be a him. She made the Nazarite vow that the razor shall not come upon his head. Now, what is a Nazarite vow? The Nazarite vow was that they were to be separated from others and consecrated to God. Separated from others and consecrated to God. They were not to drink or eat anything that had any connection at all with a grape. They couldn't have grape juice. They couldn't have raisins. They couldn't have um, wine. None of those things. That was part of the Nazarite vow. Now, as I look at this text, and I see that Hannah was concerned about her physical barrenness, we should be concerned about our spiritual barrenness. Are we concerned about our spiritual barrenness? There are times in our life where we're just not bringing life into other people's lives. Our spiritual barrenness. We feel empty. We feel alone. How do we work with that? We go before the Lord in the way that Hannah went to him. And so in verse 12, it says that Eli is watching her mouth. And she continued to pray. And now Hannah spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. And therefore he thought she was drunk because that's what will be going on at that particular time. She didn't move her lips. She did a silent prayer. God hears your silent prayer. He knows the thoughts and the intents of your heart. He knows everything about you. He has heard it, and he knows. And um, so, therefore, he asked if she was drunk. So Eli said, how long are you going to be drunk? Put your wine away from you. In verse 15, Hannah defends herself. No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I haven't drunk wine or intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. I have poured out my soul before the Lord. I am being poured out for the Lord, is what she's saying. And Eli, uh, do not consider, verse 16, do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman. 
for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, I have spoken until now. I've been praying for a long time about this. I've been praying for a long time to have a male child. And here I am now praying. Until now, I'm still praying for the same thing. And then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition, which you have asked of him. Hannah believed. Or Eli said to her, let it go. The Lord is going to give you your petition. And she believed the word of the Lord that came through Eli. She believed the word of the Lord that came through Eli. It is important that when someone gives us a word that we believe that it is a word from God, that we respond to it and that we hang on to it and we let go of that thing that we've been continuing to uh, grieve over or so forth. And he said to her that God, the God of Israel, it's implied, will grant your petition, which you have asked of him. And she said, let your maidservant, verse 18, find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way, and what did she do? She went her way, and she started eating. Remember, she hadn't eaten any food at the dinner. She didn't want any of the food. That's when her husband told her he was better than ten sons. Yeah. Because she wasn't eating. Yeah, whatever. So... Here she is, and she's gone to eat, and her face was no longer sad. Her countenance had changed. Her countenance had changed. You know why her countenance had changed? Because she had been with the Lord. She had been with the Lord. She had heard the word of the Lord. When we believe the word of the Lord, it changes our countenance. It changes how we appear to others when we have been with the Lord. Remember when Moses came down off the mountain? And he had the bright, shining face. He had the glory of the Lord on his face. And he had to put a veil over it so that the people weren't frightened by this, this brightness that he had on his face, this countenance that he had. But you also remember that Moses, because of his lack of time at the face of God, being with the Lord, he had lost that glow. But he kept the veil on and walked in pretense. Do we do that? Do we sometimes walk in a pretense because we haven't spent the time with the Lord or invested the time with the Lord that, he, that we need to have our countenance shine? We need to invest that. And I'm telling you, writing out those scriptures have changed the way that I look. I have had people tell me that I look different since I've been doing that. Just There's just something about you, they'd say. And it is because I have had that time with the Lord. My countenance has changed because I have invested the time with the Lord and I have believed what he's told me as I'm writing those scriptures down. It will always, always do that. Verse 19, then they rose early in the morning. What did they do? They got up early in the morning and they worshiped. They got up early in the morning and they worshiped. By the way, you can come 7 o'clock tomorrow morning and uh, with us and join us here for prayer as we worship the Lord in prayer. Early will I seek you. Early in the morning they came and they, they got up and they worshiped before the Lord. And then, <coughs> excuse me, and then they went to their home in Ramah, and Elkanah knew his wife, and the Lord remembered her. What does that mean? In the same way in Genesis 4-1, Adam knew Eve. They had intimate relations, and I believe that this was as soon as they got home. I believe that she immediately, because it says the Lord remembered her, I believe that she immediately conceived, miraculously conceived by the word of God. So it came to pass in the process of time, nine months, that Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name, asked of the Lord. Asked of the Lord. She had asked for a male child and 
she knew all along that that's exactly what she was going to get, was a male child. She named him a name that shows that she remembered what she had asked for and was careful to be thankful for the Lord's answer. You know, in the book Fervent it, and, and War Room, it really brings attention to our need to write down our prayer requests for our benefit so that we can put a date on it and so that when the Lord does answer that prayer and we put the answering date on there, we're encouraged, we're strengthened. We know that the Lord answers prayers. And then we share that with someone else and someone else is encouraged because they can see how the Lord has answered that prayer. And so, um, she was careful to be thankful, and I think so many times we pray, I pray, and I get an answer from the Lord, and I'm like, oh, it's finally come to pass, or something like that, and I forget that my first thing needs to be, Lord, thank you. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you for answering my prayer giving him thanks that he is due. Now the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his, and his vow in verse 21. But Hannah didn't go up for she said to her husband, not until the child is weaned, then I'll take him up and that we may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. For, forever. So Elkanah her husband said to her, do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only let the Lord establish his word. And then the woman stayed and nursed her son until she had weaned him, which would be about three years old. Now, um, it was feast time again, and off they're going. Peninnah, I'm wondering what Peninnah has to say as they're off on their way this time, because now Hannah has a baby. And... Um, so Hannah stays back. Now, it is only, um, only men were obligated to attend the feast. In the, uh, Exodus 23, 17, only men were uh, um, obligated to attend the feast. But Hannah, like other pious women, was in the habit of going, even when Peninnah made her life so miserable. But she figured it was best to defer her next journey till her son's age would enable her to keep her vow, speaking of her vow, speaking of her vow, now she tells Elkanah her vow. Did she not tell him before this time? I'm wondering. Did she not say anything before this time about what her vow was? It was important. His concurrence of her vow was necessary to make it obligatory. His concurrence with her vow was necessary to make it obligatory. Numbers 30. And he agrees, and she remains home until he was weaned about three years old. My youngest grandchild is three years old. I can't imagine. I can't imagine taking him from his home. Um, going to, she has not taken him, taken him up to the temple. He hasn't met Eli. He doesn't know anything of Eli at all. Doesn't know of anything of Eli's sons. Never been there. When I was, uh, my dad left when I was born. My mom died when I was eight years old. And when, I, when my mom died, we eventually went to live with my dad, who was a stranger. This is what it was like for Eli, or for Samuel. He was going to live with a stranger. He didn't know him, hadn't had any time with him. Um, Samuel would have had time with Peninnah's children. He would have had time with the family, and now he's going to be, at three years old, going to be given to Eli, who hasn't been able to raise his own sons properly. That's a lot of faith in God. That's a lot of faith in God. And so uh, he agreed with her, and so she went up, and, um, okay, and so uh, do what seems best to you. Um, when she had weaned, um, then... Um, they w she went up to Shiloh, and the child was young. Then they uh, took the bull and brought the child to Eli. What did they take? In verse 24, they took, uh, where it says uh, with them, they took three bulls. It was actually, uh, the Septuagint translates it as uh, a bull that was three years old. A bull that was three years old. So not three bulls, but a bull that was three years old. One ephah of flour and a skin of wine. 
one ephah of flour and a skin of wine. Here they are going up to the um, Passover, and they're bringing bread and wine and fulfilling the meat of the word with the meat that they were taking. And so the child was very young. And so when she had weaned him and she took him, took all of that in there, and she brought the child to Eli. I am hoping that Eli had a wife that uh, helped take care of this little guy um, when they did that. So verse 26, and she said, Oh, my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore, I also have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. So they worshiped the Lord there. I am keeping my vow. She says, I am keeping my vow. I'm the one that you prayed for. I'm the one that you prayed for. I remember numerous times that uh, ladies have come to me and they've asked me, would you pray for me to have a child? And I've prayed for them and they've come back later and I've kind of like forgotten it, you know, but they come back later and they go, this is the child that you prayed for. This is what was happening here with this little one, um, with Samuel, as they were going there. And she, um, she said, I'm keeping my vow. I'm lending him to the Lord. I'm giving him completely to the Lord. She gave him her son, her only son, to the Lord. There was no promise of any more children. Her son, her only son, she gave to him. What must have gone through her thoughts as she was on her way home? We'll have more children. Is this the only one? I'll just visit him once a year. Take my little coats. I wonder why had the Lord not given her a male child before this time? Why hadn't he done that? I believe that Hannah had prayed for a male child for her husband. I believe that she prayed for a child so that Peninnah would stop bothering her. But now, when Hannah came to the end of herself, Hannah came to the end of herself, she was broken. She completely surrendered herself and her child. Then God was able to do his work and do something even greater with this child that would be born. So this is the story. Have you ever been in a place where you just need to completely surrender. The Lord has spoken to you. He said, I just want all of you. The only cost is all of you. The only cost is just all of you. Complete surrender. We're going to close tonight in a little bit different way. Shannon's going to come out, and she's going to close us with a song, Oh, Come to the Altar, because I want us to look at what it's like to completely surrender, to take everything that we have. Are you thirsty and hurt? Are, are you hurting and broken within, overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. for listening to this Heart to Heart Women's Bible Study recorded at Refuge Calvary Chapel in Huntington Beach. We hope that you've been encouraged by today's lesson and join us again as we continue to study through the Word of God. For more information about the Heart to Heart Women's Ministry, please visit our website at www.refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495. Of your name, I've given up.